Welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, on behalf of Elena and all of us at Toastan, we are so pleased to welcome you to the third and final webinar in our series, Exploring Community Wellbeing. The first webinar in our series looked at well-being at the local level, and the second looked at community-centered partnerships for well-being. And today we will talk about global partnerships and how they amplify local success. My name is Kelly Baxter, and I have the great privilege of chairing Toastan's Board of Directors, and I will be your host and facilitator today. I've been involved uh, with Toastan for many years now as a board member, as a donor, and as someone who has been studying social innovation and systems change for decades. So for me, it is a real privilege to be part of the Toastan learning community. And that's really what we are, a community that learns together so that we can keep on improving our own practice and also help each other get better at bringing about positive change in the world in various ways. So Toastan has been a learning community for 30 years now. I think most of you know that this year, Toastan is celebrating its 30th uh, anniversary. Happy birthday, Toastan. And this webinar series is part of that uh, celebration. And by celebrating Toastan's anniversary, we are celebrating 30 years of learning with and innovating with the communities we serve. And we are celebrating and honoring the entire Toastan family, all the people who have helped Toastan get to where it is today and who have been part of its history and success. We honor the local leaders in the villages who show us what it means to work towards a community um, vision of well-being. We honor our stakeholders, our NGO partners, our donors, our staff, our volunteers. All of you are part of Toastan's learning community, and we continue to learn from all of you as we strive to achieve community well-being at greater scale. Unfortunately, we don't have time for all of us inter to introduce ourselves today. We're expecting about 100 on the call but I encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat box and also pose any questions you might have there. And although we will be speaking in English for this webinar, we do have live interpretation and our chat will welcome both uh, French and English comments and questions. Nous avons l'interprétation en français aujourd'hui. Merci de choisir le français si vous préférez et le chat sera modéré en anglais et français. Au bas de l'écran, uh, il devrait y avoir une option pour vous permettre de cliquer sur l'interprétation en français. Et si vous avez uh, des difficultés, demandez de l'aide dans la boîte de chat. We have such an inspiring discussion for you today, one that builds on our previous webinars. Today, we have a wonderful opportunity to look at well being from a global perspective um, and to think together about the connections between local and global. What trends, what partnerships, and what new ways of working are emerging that allow us to connect our efforts to foster well-being at the local or community level to those larger global movements that transcend individuals, communities, and organizations. And today, uh, we are privileged to have on our panel three social innovators who are going to share their insights. Let me introduce Alexander Cherry Martin, who as Regional Director for Africa for the Global Fund for Children, uh, leads their strategy for investing in and building the capacity of child and youth-centered organizations across Africa. Alex has a unique mix of private, public, and civic society experience with deep contextual understanding to his work seeking to strengthen and uplift children and youth and their communities across the continent. He is passionate about expanding the reach of global development and cultural understanding in Africa. So Bao Ngom is co-founder and executive director of the Consortium Jeunesse Senegal, which is an entrepreneurial alliance of youth organizations specializing in developing innovative solutions to help solve key learning, professional, and inclusion challenges for Senegalese youth. The consortium is also part of Generation Unlimited, a global partnership aimed at ensuring that all adolescent and young people in the world have education or decent work by 2030. Previously, Sabelle led the Social Change Factory, an African Innovation and Citizen Leadership Center that he founded in 2014. Vanessa Way is Associate Director of the Skoll Foundation, where she leads efforts to support 
the community of school awardees. Vanessa invests in, connects, and champions social innovators and leverages the foundation's assets to elevate solutions that drive transformational change. Vanessa also represents school in Catalyst 2030, a network of which Tostin is also a core member. Catalyst 2030 is a, uh, a global movement of social entrepreneurs and innovators from all, all sectors who share the common goal of creating innovative people-centric approaches to attain the sustainable development goals by 2030. So we're going to ask our panelists two rounds of questions. And based on our feedback from the last webinars, we're going, going to try and dedicate more time to questions from you um, during each session rather than waiting for the end. So if you have a question, please type it in the chat box and we will do our best to get to all of them. And I want to start our conversation today by asking each of our panelists a quick opening question. Most people working in the social sector have an image in the back of their mind or in their heart, a person, a community, a place that really represents who they are working for, what, why they do what they do. So for example, for me, when I think of Tostan, I think of a teenage girl in a rural village in Senegal, a girl who has not been married, a girl who has not been cut, a girl who has been supported to stay in school, who has positive female role models to inspire her, and who has big dreams for her future. I wanna see more girls like her in every village across Africa. Girls with agency and the support to determine their own futures. So um, I wanna ask our panelists now, who are you working for? Who comes to mind when you think about your, your work? Alex, let's start with you. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this conversation. Uh, so, for, for Global Fund for Children, the, the name gives away one of our most important uh, stakeholders, uh, the children. And so an image for me, being an African and a son of the soil, is the baobab tree, which is very synonymous with, with Africa. And seeing children play uh, under that tree and, and just having that, that freedom to, to be children and to, to live their full potential. Now, I'll permit you to just let yourself sort of wander in your imagination, wander a bit several years down the line when they're young adults and have had a full complement of education and have opportunities to be able to have meaningful livelihoods to contribute towards their community. And that's essentially what uh, GFC stands to do, to, to present and provide opportunities to children and young people uh, so that they can fulfill their full potentials. And we do this by supporting community-based organizations that work in communities that uh, these children and young people reside. Thanks, Alex. Sabel, how about you? Thanks, Kelly, and hi, everyone. I think I see a group of young people, boys and girls in rural area and suburban that um, are included in, in, in questions related to their life that can have voices in in their local governments and, and ideas that are taking in, in, in consideration. Um, I see them developing a uh, uh, concept and, 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 and project that they can lead themselves to improve their own life and their life and the life of their communities. And, and I see them also having an equal access to learning opportunities. Um, and even if it's hard to get jobs that they can fill and be sufficiently um, confident on themselves and have the right skills to be entrepreneurs and, and to create an independent and prosperous life. Thanks, Sabelle. And Vanessa, what about you? This is going to sound ridiculously selfish, <laughs> but there, I do think of myself when I start doing this work, I think because one, I am in Palo Alto <laughs> in California in the U.S., and working at the School Foundation, we are a little bit further removed from the work um, on the ground. And so I personally hold multiple identities that come from marginalized communities. And I've had the privilege to then also work in many of those communities as well. And so when I bring that, I bring all of that with me to the work at School Foundation where, you know, we have immense amount of privilege and not that I you know, want to save anyone or other things, but I really do believe that our lives are intricately tied to each other's and my liberation, my freedom, my, you know, is 
is tied to all these other communities. And so I bring all of that. And so I really do do it for all these other communities that have been marginalized, don't think about, people aren't thought about, that are not centered and not cared for in the way that <laughs> maybe in California, Palo Alto, we might not even remember. So that's who I definitely center in this work. Thanks, Vanessa. So let's build out from there. As we think about these people, the, the children, the adolescents, the marginalized communities, um, and the people who are working to help them, let's also think about the larger systems that spin around them, the government systems, economic systems, social systems. We all work at the local level with, with children, with youth, and with, with social entrepreneurs, but we also work at multiple levels and are connected to larger partnerships and collaborations and movements that are global in nature. So thinking of that connection that comes, um, that, that deep connection that comes with the opportunity to help one person or one family or one community, how do you connect that to the local level? How do you connect your local grassroots work to the larger movements and partners that you are, are part of, and partnerships that you are part of? Sabal, let's start with you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, actually, being working for a few years as um, what we call a youth-led organization, and, and there was this kind of limit that was in front of me and it was important to, 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 to think about what could break that limit because that limit was very deeply, um, uh, um, very deeply, um, sorry, I lost the word in English, planted uh, in the mind of people and, and that youth uh, have a specific role and even if they do good things, we consider that they need to do small because they are beneficiaries. They are not leaders. They are not change makers. Um, so we need to limit them in a in in a, in, in in a box and and really try to control that box. Um, Seed, thank you. <laughs> um, and um, so it, it was really important to to change many things at the same time and to change all those things. The only way to do it was to connect with people to make that government have another opinion of the young people and what they were doing, um, to make them better understand why we were engaging ourselves to fight social inequalities and to try to onboard them on this. But at the same time, it was very important that we can be very close to the communities that we are working for and listen to their needs and try to translate, to translate their needs to the national agenda that can be sometimes complicated in terms of uh, wordings and, and stuff. And also, we, we as young people, we, we, we do that engagement in, 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 a, in, in a kind of uh, with conviction, but at the same time, we need to feed ourselves. So we, we need to make a, 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 an economic uh, business model that can make our work sustainable. So we needed the private sector. So we decided to create a kind of high level board that can unite um, people from government, people from private sector, people from um, um, civil societies and young people. So, so that all of them can, can discuss in a, in a non-formal space on the way that they could better function and work together, uh, considering what uh, everybody can bring at the table and and this bring the, the, the conception of young people can bring something at the table needed to be proof for everyone to understand that if we consider young people more as partner, we will reach more results than if we consider them as beneficiaries. And that's the way we, we, we find to, to build that consortium and to have um, around us the key players in the private sector, in the civil society and in the government. Thanks, Sabal. Alex, um, would you like to go next? Oh, yes, thanks, Kelly. And, and I was nodding throughout uh, Sobel's <laughs> response <laughs> because essentially we do a lot of the things that uh, he was talking about. And effectively, GFC seeks to amplify the voices of children and youth, like I talked about, and, and help them fulfill their full potential. But we do this through community-based organizations, very much like 
uh, Consortium Genus Senegal, if I, if I pronounced it right so well. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, it's all about building these networks. Uh, a lot of the time, these community-based organizations start off with passion and then just keep on going. And I'm sure later on, we'll talk about the skill at, at an organizational level versus impact and, and, and skill, but it, it then becomes a, a, almost a, a vicious cycle of them just continuing to work and continuing to, to try and cater to the immediate, very critical needs of the communities that they serve. Uh, we provide a platform and a space for them to take a pause, take a break, and, and reflect on their work, look at how they can improve, serve as a mentor, guide, coach, sometimes a shoulder to cry on when things get difficult, uh, sometimes just a, a, an ear to listen to, to vent it. And it's in creating these relationships built on trust, uh, built on, on trying to uh, give them that platform to be equal partners, despite us as GFC wielding uh, an, in, an inevitable power as funders that we can move forward and create an environment where they can be the best version of themselves, both individually within an organization, but also collectively as an organization as they seek to meet their objectives. And that's essentially how uh, we, we try to balance that. And, and in connecting them through advocacy uh, support or through what we call traditional capacity development, which can be just sort of monitoring and evaluation, and IT, financial capacity uh, or, or resilience building and, and, and leadership development. Uh, so basically end-to-end -end support for whatever these organizations that we partner with uh, determine uh, is of their priority that will further their, their goals and enable them to be the best stewards of the resources they have provided or uh, serve their community in the best possible ways. Thanks, Alex. And Vanessa, what are your reflections on sort of connecting local to global? Yeah, I think for the work that I do, it's a lot of focus on connections and community building, which for the community that I'm part of, it's, it's social entrepreneurs and innovators that work on a lot of different issues all across the world. And so when you think about how to support and connect them to different pieces, um, one of the things that I definitely really try to do is to share power with the people that we work with. So for the entrepreneurs that we do um, are part of this community, they inform exactly what we're gonna build and what we're gonna do. And I love the analogy that they use of like, this is what we're doing and what we're building together, which is for a lot of social innovation or social entrepreneurs, they're focused on their specific trees, this analogy of a forest. And they have these trees of like, I'm working in water in Africa, and this is, I gotta take care of that. It's really important. There's all these critical issues, but at the same time, because we have such a global network that works on so many diverse issues, it's also helping people see the whole forest and how their trees are connected to the other trees and that view of the two. And so that's really how I actually think about our work is one, accelerating the work of the specific trees. And so really focusing and bringing the community together to drive change on specific issues. With Skull's strategy evolution, we did choose five specific strategic priorities so that we can really focus that work um, and build coalitions and um, resources and things like that to really elevate solutions in those areas. But at the same time, we know all of these things are interconnected. And so also then taking a step back and being like, hey, what else do we need to see beyond that? What are the themes that are across all of these things that we really need to knit together to solve and weave? And that's really hard. And so sometimes I feel like when we're doing these things with our community, it's we're taking them and like making them yo-yo back and forth of like on the ground, let's go up here to the top of the forest and go back down. But that's sometimes needed to really make sure we're not missing some of the, the big problems or issues that we're facing together and to be able to actually learn from each other on those things. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I have a million questions for all of you, but I'm going to uh, defer to our audience uh, and uh, I'm gonna ask the first question. Um, what are the biggest obstacles um, when it comes to changing uh, old traditional um, patterns and ways of working? So what, what's hard to change and, and, and you know, how are you overcoming those obstacles when it comes to um, old ways of working? 
Oh. Any of you can jump in. I, I can I can <laughs> go first. So so partnerships and and <clears throat> habits, old habits are, are difficult to to break, right? Even at a personal level. And, and so it's it's something that takes time and also takes a lot of trust. And trust is not built overnight. And so our model is to just continue right from the very first interaction we have with uh, our partners at that point, prospective partners. Uh, we try to continue to show them and give them that opportunity to, to, to really be part of the conversation. And I talked about the power dynamic earlier and really try to put the, the power in their hands to drive the narrative, to drive the conversation. Uh, similar to Vanessa, what you mentioned about the, your, your stakeholders really driving the narrative. I feel like that's a very simple and important ingredient in really starting that chain of reaction that gets to a breaking or unbreaking some of these land habits. And, and I draw a parallel to, to toss time and, and your, your approach to your work, right? And it's, it's really coming at a place of sincerity and, and trust and openness and transparency because the change takes time. And you, you, you will get frustrated if you're looking to do it overnight. It's, it's really a, a matter of uh, little steps and sort of building upon those steps and laying the foundation for more interactions that will seek to then arrive at a point where you are realizing a change uh, and really fulfilling the, the goals and objectives of the partnership. Thanks, Alex. Does anyone else want to um... Wait into that one. Yeah, I, I very agree with what Alex just just said, and and I would say for for us too, the 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 the, the main challenge is what and and still we are fighting against that is legitimacy. Um, who are we as uh, 10, uh, 10 young leaders leading our teams because of our conviction going to tell to the government no, this is how you need to act, or telling to partners no, what you do is not good and and if you if you want to have more impact you need to do it that way uh we are most of us under 30 um so so people questions about um uh, are you mandate who, who mandated you to to do that uh what is the the who is behind you um and and a lot of questions uh um uh, people ask about yeah knowing are we instrumentalized by anyone are we um you know uh, th those kind of questions, and and I think it's 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 difficult because the base of the partnership is is the the perception of your partner is your equal, and and what and it's really hard for us, but we are doing it, and we're very proud of the the first results um, to 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 tell uh, our our partners in the government in the in the in the private and in the, um, the development sectors that yes. We, we, we are your equal. We don't have the same resources in terms of money, but we do have skills and assets that you need to reach what you, you, you want to reach to have a good uh, result at the end of the year. So it's you now that need to learn to see us differently. And, and this is a strong part of our narrative. And, and it has definitely audacity, a lot of audacity. And, and sometimes people just Look, uh, uh, knock the door to us because they just don't want to talk to us. But, but we need to to force some doors and and to change the the um, I, I would say the the in French. Elena, maybe you can help me. Le rapport de force. And the fact we are together and we are strong together. Um, this is the lesson. The key lessons I, I learned about that experience. That yes, it's easier to make it to, to change the perspective when many people that are credible say the same thing at the same moment than when one of us just try to do his agenda alone. Thanks, Sabal. Vanessa, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I 100% echo that with the power dynamics and things like that. I think for school, when we think about it, one of our values is being really humble and understanding that there is power dynamics and we name it in a lot of the relationships that we have. And what I think we do is try to empower um, people or organizations to speak truth to that power. I mean, part of it is like in some ways being further removed of like, I always have to remind myself like, what was it like when I was working still on the ground? Like, do I remember, am I bringing that piece back into this? And when you're, 
in very cushy Palo Alto and it's lovely here, like you forget. And so we need people to speak the truth to us and it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but then that's how we change. I think a lot of times we know that the social innovators and people, they know the best. And so we just need to make sure that we continue to listen. And that is part of, you know, it is a little cultural where in the, in the US we have a very big speaking culture compared to being able to listen more and understand, make sure that we're taking into account other things. And so we have to pause. And in my mind, for some of us in privilege, we need to be quiet and listen. Thanks, Vanessa. So just one quick uh, follow-up question then. You're all saying the same thing, um, that um, you know we need to build trust, change takes time. Um, we need to um, change the power dynamics. Are all the obstacles the same globally or um, are you seeing um, differences in, in different cultures? Does anyone wanna? Yeah. Vanessa, maybe you have something to add to that given that your you know, perspective is a bit um, more global in terms of who you're working with. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the things that's very core to our work because it is, we work with such a global audience, right? And so when we're really talking about centering um, the grassroots efforts and things like that, each of those cultures are uniquely different and how they interact with each other, um, how they ask for things or don't ask for things. And so these are things that when I think about how I do my work, it's, we know we wanna offer these to everyone, but if we offer, offer them equally, it's actually not equity. And so I have to think through like culturally, if we have people who are working in Asia, are they really gonna be trying to pitch me all of the things? And so I actually take the extra effort on our end to say, hey, we have these opportunities. Can you make sure you share with us and like invite them into that space because it's not, it's a very different. And I'm speaking from my own Asian context, which is not the same globally across all of the Asian countries. And so it's those pieces. So, so there is cultural difference that we have to then approach our work really differently and center equity and make those adjustments to make sure we're serving everybody. Thanks, Vanessa. Maybe we'll, um jump into the second question now. Um, oh, hang on, we've got one more here. Um, you know, I'm gonna come back to this question after we do our, 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 our next round, just so we don't run out of time. Um, we have many people joining us um, here today that are, are running their own programs. Um, and the three of you are working with organizations that are innovating, that are trying new things and that are collaborating in new ways still within this space of thinking about how we are building systems around local leaders and local communities. Um, I wanna ask Alex and Sobel, what is one innovation, one partnership, um, one new way of working um, that you're really excited about right now? No, I would say, like, yeah, the, the, um, for me, the, 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 the work I do now um, by being uh, around it with, a lot of youth-led organizations that have all their specificities, their assets, uh, and their, their, their strengths in different places. And it's like a puzzle, you know, and there is, there is a lot of issues of young people that we have solutions for. And, and what, what is very exciting now, it's when we, we meet people, uh, people just, I mean, organizations do have their focus. So they work on education and this is the, their priority and education and that's it. And if you don't work on that area on education, they cannot talk to you necessarily because they have the agenda. And, and the fact that we have all these, um, the, the, these organization around us and, and the, this variety of solutions make us very strong when we discuss with partners because we can, we can connect. And our strong uh, conviction is like for, for the development of young people, there is three components, the component of access, the component of learn and the component of work. And, and it's not smart to, to, to deal with one without the two others. And even the partners do have their agenda. It's us that try to put their solution in a bigger agenda that have a component be before and a component after. And this is very exciting because we create four for our big partners, connections that they never had before. And we create for our youth uh, solutions, connection they never had before. So this is a real game of being uh, in between um, the masterclass of key players and uh, the masterclass of young innovators that have 
valuable and scalable solution and to connect them where it fits by following the agenda that we design for us, not the agenda that the government design or the partners design. And I, I feel that very excited because it's give us for one of the first time, uh, I would say in our common uh, way of uh, leading countries and communities, the power of young people to, to, be, to, to, to sit at the table and to have high level negotiations in terms of law, in terms of money, in terms of funding, um, in terms of policies um, that, that, that we have access now as we are a strong group that we did not have before. Great, thanks, Sabal. Alex? Yes, and so uh, there, there are two that uh, uh, we're quite excited about, but since Kelly, you asked for one, I'm going to stick <laughs> to one. I'm going to be, be obedient and stick to, to one. Uh, which is the Spark Fund. Uh, we just recently launched that, and it's an initiative in partnership with Abbas Foundation. So an example of, again, partnerships that drive uh, change at the local level. And this is a pretty exciting initiative because it is invested in youth, solely youth-led and youth-focused groups uh, around the world. It's a global initiative. Uh, so I'm just chomping at the bits for it to be Africa's turn, since Africa is uh, where I, I work primarily. Uh, but essentially the, the goal is to provide support, capacity development support to youth groups and youth focus groups, in addition to flexible funding and helping them sort of test out and learn and, and operate in this post pandemic world. If you can call it the post pandemic world, that is. Uh, in many ways, it feels like we're still in an ongoing uh, pandemic, uh, but also just, just really uh, creating a participatory uh, framework that enables decisions to be made by young people. So setting up a, a panel of young decision makers who determine the criteria for selection, who then determine how much and how often to give to these organizations and investing in the, 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 the organizations we support, but also strengthening their networks and advocacy uh, to support movement building and learning across the board. And this is something that really speaks truth to what we exist to do, which is amplifying the voices of young people. And we're really excited to, to kick it off. It's starting in Europe and then going to gradually uh, filter around the, the, the rest of the, the globe. And like I said, I'm, I'm just desperately waiting early next year when it's Africa's turn to, to really test out these things. But that's, that's one thing that's just kicked off and has kept us busy over the last few weeks and, and months. And we're looking forward to, to learning quite a lot about that. Amazing. Um, thank you both. Um, Vanessa, I'm going to ask you um, a slightly different question um, about scaling impact. So I know that uh, School recently published um, a forward looking piece that explored scaling impact versus scaling an organization. Um, perhaps we can put the link to the article in, um, in the chat so that others can also look at it. Um, in my work, I'm always fascinated to find examples of scaling impact, um, which, which always involves building collaborations and movements. So Vanessa, do you want to share, share some thoughts about this, either um, your work at school or through the uh, Catalyst 2030 network? What are you seeing and learning about innovative ways that we can um, accelerate and amplify our impact by learning to work together differently? Yeah, I think Catalyst 2030 definitely comes to mind for me for a lot of this, which it is a movement of social innovators who are coming together to collaborate radically to reach sustainable development goals. I mean, those goals are big, they're hairy, they're all interconnected. Um, and with all reports, like we're not gonna meet them if we're continue to work the way that we want, the, one thing, the way that we currently are um, in the structures and the systems that really incentivize us to do you know, to scale our own organization, to scale our own solutions and things like that. And so the article that um, Kelly mentioned, we talk about this idea of coming from the founder of Cal 2030 is, you know, we, we can come and have solutions and we can knit solutions together, but does the organization who came up with that solution needs to be the one that expands it across globally? Or can those solutions be shared and knit together and be localized in um, all of these pieces? And that's something that I think is really interesting um, concept. And one of the things that I observed in Catalyst 2030 that's really amazing, but also really hard to do is 
when we're coming up with these solutions and addressing these problems, people are coming together and they're taking off the organizational hat and they're taking off the, this is my solution and it's the best solution. It's going to be amazing. And you need to adopt this. They come and it's like, we have this problem in health. <laughs> I have these solutions. You have those solutions. You're working in these regions. How do we bring that together? And it's a little bit of like less of me and more of us. And it's magical and it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, like it's, I don't know, I'm always blown away when it does. And so that's when you get these amazing reports that like are hard hitting because it's like, oh yeah, like that makes sense. <laughs> we need to work together. But all the incentives, you know, the way grants are, it's like you're competing for the same money and all of those things. And so a lot of that for California is also then speaking truth to power, being like, hey, funders, <laughs> collectively across Social, um, and social innovators, like we've identified these things, you're not doing all of them and, and giving tools for people to how to make those changes as well. And so we are working on a lot of different levels. Um, it gets a little chaotic and crazy, but that's how movements are. And for us to be okay with getting into the mess, taking off our professional hats and coming as people who wanna solve the problem. Thanks, Vanessa. I think that's really um, sort of a transformational moment for a social innovator to kind of put the issue at the center rather than their own organization, which they put so much effort into to creating because they they have such a burning passion for the issue. Um, so Belle and Alex, did you, do you want to sort of have any thoughts to add to that? You know, what that, that moment where you go from my organization, my ideas, my programs to, I can address the issue if I actually let go of some of that and, and work differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I love um, uh, what has just been said about uh, uh, less of me and more of us, um, actually. Uh, and, and, I, and I always say it differently. It's like to build, to build a, a strong power, every one of us needs to drop a part of this sovereignty, um, to have a common sovereignty. And um, that's the jump I made by leaving Social Change Factory, my baby that I created and led for, for six years and leave at a very good position because I was convinced, and convinced at that time that Social Change Factory could be the great it could be, but it won't be enough to solve the, the, is, the, the issues that are faced by young people. And even the consortium is not enough, but that idea is that we could come together and. And I think that coming together, it's not a plus, it's, it's a multiplication. And, and I can really see it in a way that what we have been doing in a year, uh, it's, it's, it's so, so much more than even the addition of what each of us have been doing in the last two or, or three years. So there is a, the, a reality of being together, but also there is a difficulty by being together because Everyone need also to survive. Everyone still consider itself and want to protect himself. So there is a, a role, a strong role for the leaders of, of those groups to, to make sure um, of transparency, of equity uh, in the repartition of resources, um, transparency in the information and the opportunity. And, and yes, to be, to be very open in a way that we can navigate. Things are, won't, when you, when you are together, things won't be straight anymore. They will have ways, but it's, it's, it's us as leader of groups that need to control those waves and accept that there is waves and it's not a problem. It's just the way that we can navigate on waves that we have to structure uh, and, and we can create strong communities because there is a, I mean, everybody says that yes, it's stronger together, but few are getting to that point to build a, a strong together because it's difficult and, and we don't talk about enough the difficulty to, 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 to create collectives like, like that, but it needs to be a, a process with, with, um, with a it's a learning process. And, um, and I think it's, it's important to pass by that and to accept that some will be, um, uh, some will be happy at some time and not happy at another time. And, and it's part of the deal. So, we, we, we develop very strong bylaws and also a very strong cooperative agreement um, that we take a year to build really to make all of us comfortable 
and, and all of us can understand what are the rules we need to navigate on. Thanks, Abel. Alex, do you want to no, yeah, there's, there's not much to add after Vanessa and Sobel's uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. This is something we routinely see and, and grapple with with our partners. This difficulty in, in really living true to the idea of partnerships, because as Sobel has said in many respects, there's an in, inherent sort of competition that is, is present uh, because you have to survive. Uh, you need to go after the similar grants. And that advice a few years ago, Global Fund for Children's decision to now support in courts. And so that's, that's kind of one of the things we do to try and engineer this partnership. And so support every initiative as a cohort that from the very beginning sort of starts to frame the, the, the minds of the leaders to start to look at each other as resources and not as competitors because they're all going to be getting funding, they're all going to be getting capacity development. And in doing this, uh, we hope to continue to see some sort of organic collaboration because you can't also force that partnership. Uh, that's, that's uh, I think, a recipe for disaster and, and some of these things have to be organic. Yeah? So you can only create the platform, the environment and the space for these partnerships and, and collaborations to happen. Uh, but you need to let them figure it out on their own sometimes. And it's just a process uh, that is usually beautiful at the end if it's, if it's realized, but it does take time, like, like my colleagues have mentioned. Thanks, Alex. Well, let's look at the flip side. How do you shift um, potential donors from the mindset of, you know, they go in knowing what they want to fund and have predetermined ideas of what the outcomes should be to keeping an open mind about new ways of working and sort of non-traditional partnerships and, and, and programs. How do you do that? I'm, I'm laughing because I'm not sure I, I have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, it, it's, 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 it's been a difficulty, it's been a challenge. And, but then the, the, the good thing is that we're seeing and hearing a lot more uh, talk about things like shift the power and trust-based philanthropy. But are all really elements, although they have their nuances and unique differences, all seeking to achieve the same thing, really balance the, the scale of power, really approach conversations with a certain perspective. And, and as I think, Sobel, you mentioned some, uh, some minutes back about really giving that space to, to your organization and sometimes you having the audacity to, to take that space. Uh, it's, it's, it's just really having this continuous conversation. And I, I see a shift gradual, a bit slower than some of us would, would like, but I see that shift happening. And I think we're, we're heading in the right direction, but I specifically answering your question, I'm not sure what, what, what can be done to amplify and, and quickly sort of make that process faster than it is. I think organizations like those present and maybe those uh, also on the, on, on the chat, I will continue to just espouse their beliefs and their, their values and, and sort of maybe be testament of what can be done and what can be achieved if uh, you give organizations that space to really be part of, meaningfully be part of conversation. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. And, and, and I, 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 will, I will add to that, uh, I, I will just tell a story um, that, that, that happened and that also um, shift something. We, there is a partner um, in Senegal that wanted to, to work on a very huge proposal um, to, to work on a youth, uh, a youth center um, in, in some place in Senegal. And, and, they, and they wanted to meet with um, a dozen of uh, youth-led organizations, incubators and, and everything. So they, all, they invited us all on the table and told us, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. Uh, this is a very important thing. So we want us to, we will, um, we will send a call for a proposition and, and then each of you can submit their ideas. And one of us uh, take the leadership to say, no, we won't gonna submit. There is two options here because around the table, you have the better players of the, of the country in, in what you, you, you specifically need. And we came together uh, actually to be able to work as a group on those kinds of opportunities. So uh, we want you to reconsider your call for proposition 
and ask us as a group to make you a proposition on what could be done. Uh, and so that we don't have to challenge the one against each other, but to pr propose you something with the best of our solution. And that works. And it was not easy for the partner because that was on their rules. So they have to come until the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to negotiate the opportunity and to make the rule change with the argument we give them. I really think that partners are sincere today when they say uh, we need to include more young people, we need to include more vulnerables. They, they, they believe that. They just don't know how to. And while we understand that they don't know how to, we need to give them opportunities to, 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 to take and to act from those opportunities. And I think the fact as a group, we say, we don't want to go alone and to fight for your proposition, but we are uh, aware and able to make you a strong proposition with all our strength. That was an opportunity for the partner to consider something new, and they did it. And, and I think sometimes it's not, we, we, we don't have to wait until the partner to change his process. We need to, to, um, to, to, to have a, a strong contextual uh, uh, intelligence and to be able to, to give them an opportunity that they can leverage to transform themselves first. I'll offer just some practical things specifically coming out of um, Catalyst 23. I'm going to share in the chat. They did do a report specifically on embracing complexities of specifically what funders need to do to be better supporters of systems change in that change is non-linear and being able to listen, all of the things that Sabelle and Alexander had shared. And one of the things that just came out is a funder self-assessment. How are you doing in this journey? Are you utterly like in the beginnings of this journey? Are you advanced? What can things can you change? I will say like, this literally just released. And so it's just interesting because we know funders need to change. We know, um, and, and that's the role that school is thinking about because we are a funder in philanthropy and how can we continue to influence that? And also how can we continue to live into what people have called out as like, these things are important. And, and we say like, it is sometimes hard to remember like, oh, you know, if we try to give money out the door really quickly and we're not thinking about these things, we might actually be doing more harm. And so be a pause and to, to do to do the work. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. So, um, one more question. So, we've talked about um, some of the problems and challenges that young people face, um, but we're also seeing some successes. Um, can you just share, you know, just share one of the positive things that you, that you're seeing in your work? I think there is a lot of success. Um, from from young people and and actually I would just say in Senegal in the last three weeks there was a young Senegalese that win an international scientific competition one of the biggest there was a young Senegalese that that won the Gonco Prize which is the best prize in literature uh, there was a young Senegalese that won one of the uh, uh, the, the, the 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 best arts. Uh, um, uh, a prize in, in photography and, and the three of them are very engaged. So there is a positive narrative of, of young people across the continent. And, and I think actually we can, we, we can the, the fact that as young people today really want to take in charge their life and their communities is the proof of the success that are happening. Otherwise, they would still be sitting and waiting for chance. And I think, yeah, we, we are a, a one of the continent that where young people are, are the most standing up uh, to say that, okay, as we do not receive what we were expecting, we need to go and look for it. But at the same time, we want to engage to change our countries. Another example in Senegal, the, there is a law and there is a process of that law that is being leading by one of our member, IFO policy. Uh, which is the Startup Act. Maybe a few of you uh, have ever uh, heard about it. This is the, the a law on the startups that can really help young people to, enter, to be entrepreneurs and to have facilities uh, with the government to get formal and to have access to tax exonerations and, 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 and things like that. Uh, and this is one of the rare law that have been fully designed, proposed and, and pushed by young people with the support of the government but really led by young people and that got to a vote at the national assembly and an endorsement from the president so i think yes there is there is a lot of success 
um, there is a lot of now uh, media that show those success by young people. Uh, and I think this is very positive. And, and this is also for me uh, a, a very strong uh, strength that it gives me because I know that I am not alone. We are many, many like me trying to do their best to change their small things. And now it's, it's the time to connect the small things we do to really bring big things. Thanks, Saval. I like that, connecting the small things to make something bigger. And we're seeing very similar things. And, and I think it's, it's clear with Africa being the youngest uh, continent that it's crucial that young people are given a voice uh, because they are the future of the continent. And we are seeing that in cases where we're not giving them a voice, they are demanding it. And so there are several young movements, youth movements across several different spheres. So climate change to civic spaces demanding more representation uh, to better education. We're seeing that all across the continent. And that is uh, something that is, is a sight in us because that is also a proven that it is important to continue to just provide them with that space because when you give them that space, they do show and prove and do uh, really uh, legitimize that the, the reason for, for doing, giving them the, the, the opportunities. And so that's something we are continuing to seek out and be more deliberate in supporting youth led and not sort of uh, just youth led in name, but youth led in practice where it is young people. I always say I'm, I'm very, I'm not comfortable with the official definition of youth uh, because when you're, when you're 35, it's, 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 for me, it's a, it's, it's a, little, it's a little older than uh, what, what a youth should be. And, and so really being deliberate to support young, young adults, the younger demographic of that range, uh, because they have a lot to contribute, but usually are not given the, the opportunity because it, even in that space of youth, we defer to the older uh, range of, 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 of that subset. And so it's just really being deliberate to continue to, to build on the, the successes that we're seeing and the, the emergence of young movements around the continent. I think we'll, we'll continue to, to improve upon this space generally and really show impact in, in community. Thanks, Alex. Vanessa, do you have anything you want to add? I think as terrible as the last two years were with the pandemic and all of these things, I think what also really happens that gives me hope in the midst of all of that is we are at a place where we're centering a lot more equity. And I see that across, you know, funders, organizations, and that it's, you know, in the US there was like a racial equity happening and there's gender equity, there's all of these things and it's coming to the forefront. And so really making sure that we are then centering these, these issues and making sure that we're designing around them and not what has traditionally been working. I think that it was a big wake up call for a lot of people that what we've been doing is not working and that, you know, there's now a window as we come back some, for some countries coming out of this and trying to figure out what we need to do, not going back to the new normal. And so I'm excited for what we have before us, but also ready to roll up my sleeves with each of you to do, to do that work together. Thanks, Vanessa. Well, I'm sorry to say that we are running out of time, so I need to move us to close now. Um, I have the privilege of, of closing not only this wonderful session, but um, the fall webinar series on well-being. So I'd like to thank our amazing panelists today. You've been so passionate and you're so inspiring. And I have so many more questions. I wish we could stay for another hour, but thank you uh, for sharing your passion and your insights with us today and for the work that you are doing in the world, which is so important. Um, thank you to our interpreters. Um, I know it's not easy to interpret in real time, especially when we are all excited and speaking quickly. <laughs> Um, I hope it worked out for, for those that, that used it. Um, and um, I just want to remind you that the first two recordings of our first two webinars are on our YouTube page, and this one will be uh, shortly. So our hope in this series was to celebrate Tostan's 30th anniversary by creating um, a, a place for partners and staff and the global community to highlight their work and connect um, and to elevate important topics and emerging ideas. 
Um, and of course, to think and learn together um, about how we can scale community well-being. So it's been such a pleasure to see so many people on this call from all around the world. Uh, we'd love to keep hearing from you. Um, and um, please let us know how we can continue to improve these webinars. So on behalf of the Toast End Board, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the work that you are all doing in the world and for being part of this community. And now I would like to hand it over to Toast End CEO, Elena Bonametti, to have the last word. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Vanessa, Sobel, and um, Alex. As I was saying in the chat box, we had over 60 participants from many different continents, from many different parts of the world. I think it was the great, a great crowd to end this wonderful series. So maybe to quote or to use some of the words that you use, this, this series was really uh, less about uh, uh, as in the sense of Tostan, less about me, but more, you know, about us. And that's why we really wanted to close on global partnership, because this is the focus and the direction that we see to really amplify the impact that we have seen over the past 30, 30 years. So, you know, we are moving ahead with a lot of optimism. And uh, thank you for sharing some great successes that all of you are experiencing on the field. We are as well. We are excited and positive about the future about the future of how funding is changing, but in particular about the future of our communities with whom we partner and we see they are the one who are taking it to the next level. So we are excited about the next 30 years actually, and we are embarking in a strategic thinking next year. We will have really partnership and global partnership at the core of that new strategic thinking because we really believe that with the uh, people in the room, in this virtual room today, under the baobab, as Alex was saying, we really can do much more together in, in a better way, in more sustainable way, uh, having really well-being at the, at the core of, of all of this. So thank you for being with us. For the three of them, I know some of you have seen it, you have attended three of them, the three webinars in the series. We really appreciate so much your support, your contribution, your care and your love. Uh, and, you know, thank you again, uh, uh, Kelly and the panelists for making this such a wonderful ending. And uh, see you soon. A bientôt.